start admitting people. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to our Encuentro. Good to have you all here. We'll get started with our amazing panel in just a couple minutes. Just letting folks into the meeting. If we want to maybe go on to the agenda slides that we can get folks an idea of what today's or this hour is going to look like. So we'll start out with a welcome. Um, you know, as I said, folks are going to be trickling in and we also have an exciting icebreaker question that we're going to be sharing with you all in just a second. And then we'll dive into our panel discussion, also give some time for Q&A, and then have our wrap up. So that's what our hours uh, together is going to look like. Welcome everyone who's just joining. And yeah, let's, let's start out with the icebreaker question. We can go on to the next slide. So with the topic of extreme heat and our discussion today, we'd love for you all to imagine you were more than human just for a second. And if you were a solution to urban heat, what type of flora would you be? So if you can go on to um, menti.com with uh, scanning that code, and I believe there's also a link in the chat that you can click, go in on the menti.com and type in your answer. And we'll give folks a couple minutes to, to think about that and share their, their responses. Also, apologies, really quick, I did not even introduce myself. I was so excited to start the, <laughs> the encuentro. My name is uh, Amanda Pantoja, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm with Green Latinos, part of their sustainable communities team. And also uh, other folks on our Green Latinos team is Maritza with Public Lands and Ocean, Pedro and Olivia and Andrea from our team. And Val, who's off camera, so we can't see them. <laughs> yeah, and we'll share the results of the mentee in maybe like a minute or two as folks fill out the responses. I think me personally, uh, I would probably want to be a pocket park. That would be really cool. Probably a tree in a pocket park to be specific. But yeah, I'm really excited to see what everyone else is answering. Mm -hmm. I think maybe we can go ahead and share the results if uh, that's ready. All right. Okay. So we got Palo Verde, fig tree, lots of trees. I love that. Acaranda tree. Yes. There's a lot right now in LA blooming. They're so beautiful. Something with shade. I agree. Prickly pear cactus, that's amazing. Vines growing over walls and lampposts, I love that one. 
Oh my gosh, yes, preferably flowering vines. Amazing. A water feature, maple, green alley. I love that. We definitely need more green alleys. Yes, all so amazing. Thank you all for indulging us on this break um, icebreaker question. Y'all are very imaginative and I love all of these answers. So yeah, thanks so much for participating. I think we're ready to kind of start the opening. So for this, for those who are um, just uh, diving into our Green Latinos Encuentro for the first time, just want to introduce ourselves. So uh, Green Latinos is an active comunidad of Latino leaders, and we're all focusing on winning our environmental conservation and climate justice battles. And we're driven to secure our political, economic, and cultural environmental liberation. And we are just a big comunidad of uh, community leaders across the nation. We have a bunch of people spread across the US doing amazing work. And we also have uh, a membership that you all, we would love for you to join as a Green Latinos member. We can drop the link in the chat on how to join our Green Latinos membership, but overall just uh, the membership helps us to continue our mission to fight for environmental liberation. And the membership includes access to opportunities to take action, um, share resources, come to events with us. So we would love to have every single one of you join us. And also want to share another opportunity for you all to get involved with Green Latinos, which is through our colectivos. So each one of our policy priority, priorities here on uh, the Encuentro, public lands, ocean equity, sustainable communities, as well as climate justice and Colorado team do have a colectivo. And the colectivos are spaces for us um, and Green Latinos members to come together and you know, dive into creating community even more, build a sense of familia and partnerships, share information. Uh, they're primarily used as a learning hub to develop, you know, advocacy tactics and just ways to uh, empower one another. So um, later on in our encuentro, we'll also be sharing how you all can join our colectivos. And it's just overall a great way to plug into the work that um, our team is working on. So we'd love to also have you join our colectivos. And with that being said, uh, I'm going to be passing it um, to Pedro and our amazing panel that we have today. Uh, we'll be discussing um, extreme heat and we have an amazing panel of community leaders and advocates that are um, working to address extreme heat in our communities. You know, we're seeing across the world, record-breaking temperatures, and this is just becoming um, a very critical climate impact for us to be addressing, one that specifically to, um, is impacting communities of color. So we have an amazing group of panel that's doing the work on um, helping communities of color um, mitigate extreme heat impacts and be resilient during these times. So uh, I'll pass it to Pedro to kick us off in our discussion. Yeah, hi everybody, thanks for joining us. Um, my name is Pedro Antonio Hernandez and I'm the public lands advocate here with Green Latinos. Um, and again, thanks for making time out of your day to hang out with us and, um, and enjoy this very, very fun conversation that we have planned for y'all. Um, so I'm, I'm based in Fresno, California. It's gonna be about 113 degrees over um, uh, this, this weekend and more broadly about 20 to 30% of the United States is under extreme heat um, advisories right now. So this is a very timely event. Um, but before we get into our questions, I'm gonna actually give um, our panelists um, a couple of minutes to introduce themselves. And so um, we can go just in the order of our um, slide here. So we'll start off with Paulina and end with Enrique. Um, and y'all just take a, a a uh, couple minutes to introduce yourselves and who you're with and what you do. Um, and then I have a couple of questions to guide our conversation. So, um, Valina, if you don't mind, uh, please start us off. Yes, of course. Thank you um, so much, Pedro. Uh, buenos dias con todos. Muy buenos dias. Good morning. Um, my name is Paulina Lopez. Um, I go by she, her, ella, and I'm the executive director for the Duwamish River Community Coalition, which is um, organization, environmental justice organization in the South Seattle area. 
Um, we are in the Duwamish um, and Col Salish um, territories for our people, first um, people of Seattle. And um, I have been here involved um, with our neighborhood and our community as I am also a community member uh, for the past 15 years. Um, my organization focuses on, uh, as I said, environmental injustices to turn them into justice. Um, and we've been doing this um, since 2001. So I'm very, very happy for this space to be sharing with you all. And uh, I can wait to learn from um, our uh, colleagues here on the panel. And I'm going to pass it to Delia. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. My name is Delia. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the youth program coordinator um, at Communities for a Better Environment. Um, and I'm based in Southeast LA on Tongva land. Um, and we do a lot of work around um, making sure that everyone has access to clean air, water, and soil. Um, and my role specifically is working with young people in the area to organize around um, environmental racism and ensure that we have community community-led strategies to address them. Um, so we've done a lot of park work in the recent years to renovate parks and bring more green space to address um, the urban heat that we have here in the area. Um, additionally, a lot of our community members are tenants. Um, so we've been doing a lot of work around tenants to ensure that they know their rights. Um, but you know, as we talk to more tenants, we're realizing that a lot of people don't have access to AC, don't have access to cooling centers. Um, so that's some of the work that we're also addressing through our resilience work. Um, thank you and happy to talk more. Um, great. Um, Renan, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Pedro. Good morning, everyone. My name is Renee Jimenez from the San Gabriel Valley Conservation Corps. Uh, we're a workforce development nonprofit for young adults, 18 to 26 year olds. Our mission is to um, develop and transform disadvantaged youth in the San Gabriel Valley by providing academic, vocational, and leadership development, while also employing them to provide valuable services to their communities and our natural environment. Um, essentially, as a workforce development nonprofit, we pay our program participants to do a few things, to learn and earn industry-recognized certifications, attend life skills and job readiness workshops, and most importantly, to improve their communities and our environment. We implement projects throughout the San Gabriel Valley and the San Gabriel Mountains. Um, next slide, please. Looks like they're, they're up. Yeah, so uh, we're not gonna be going through the whole presentation since it's just brief introductions, but overall, uh, as a nonprofit here in Southern California, we greatly depend on partnerships to implement all of our projects. Uh, ultimately, we, we really depend on our folks like the Forest Service, CAL FIRE, Watershed Conservation Authority, all those land managers to work with us to provide guidance on these implementation projects that do a wide range of things like, you know, restore habitats, um, plant trees, reforest, uh, but also restore campsites, doing things like that. So uh, next slide, please, Pedro. Um, so besides working with those state agencies, uh, next slide, please. We also work with uh, the San Gabriel Mountains Community Collaborative, which is essentially a uh, community collaborative uh, comprised of stakeholders that advocate for the San Gabriel Mountains, uh, the National Monument, and overall um, just just restoring that and, and, and preserving that space and habitat uh, for sustainable recreation and our preservation of wildlife, right? Um, so just to expand a little bit on partnerships, as a small nonprofit here in Southern California, we depend on a lot of state agencies, but more importantly, we depend on these win-win solutions and win-win partnerships. So when it comes to addressing, you know, big, big problems like the climate crisis and our ever-growing, excuse me, the phone is ringing, um, we, we really depend on these win-win solutions to be able to advocate and improve environmental justice problems and overall, um, you know, just address these solutions, um, excuse me, address these problems with good solutions. Uh, next slide, please. So some of the projects that we do uh, on a regular basis is uh, tree planting and maintenance, drought tolerant and native plants, uh, native plant planting, fire fuel reduction, trail building and maintenance for a wide range of forest conservation projects, habitat restoration, invasive species removal, graffiti and litter abatement up in the mountains, general landscaping, urban farming, uh, city beautification, and much, much more. So 
through these projects, through our partners, we really address a lot of things in the San Gabriel Valley. So looking forward to hearing all the great panelists and continuing our discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Renee, for uh, that uh, thorough uh, presentation of your organization's work. Um, my name is Enrique Huerta. I'm the legislative director here at Climate Resolve. And I want to give Green Latinos a shout out for thinking of little old me and inviting me to this panel. I'm super honored to be here with so many amazing uh, local leaders who are elevating their communities and protecting them against the ravages of extreme heat. Uh, Climate Resolve is a Los Angeles based nonprofit and we go around making a lot of friends and uh, we go around making friends with a lot of money who can fund a lot of our work. And uh, sometimes I bring these friends to the state capitol in Sacramento and we go around knocking on uh, legislators doors and getting their attention on the need not only to remove and reduce greenhouse gases from our atmosphere, super important work, but the need to adapt to extreme heat today. And um, I look forward to talking to you some more about some of the work that Climate Resolve is doing with many of our wonderful partners. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank, thank you all for joining us as well too. I'm really excited for, uh, for this discussion to come. Um, so we'll start um, in reverse order. So we'll start off with Enrique, Rene, Lilia, and close off with Paulina for this first question. Um, and just for an, uh, to give you an idea of the arc that I have planned is we'll start off locally and then end in a really big picture discussion. So um, Enrique, to start us off um, in about two to three minutes, uh, can you share your experience with extreme heat um, and one project that you're really proud of uh, working on, whether it's, you know, currently or historically that you've worked on? Uh, sure thing. So um, uh, our offices are in uh, the downtown LA Arts District, but I live in Southeast Los Angeles and uh, we work in many of the communities like Southeast Los Angeles who have been redlined uh, through some really messed up uh, real estate and planning policies. Uh, these are communities with very low shade, uh, highly exposed to a lot of sunshine, um, a lot of heat absorbing surfaces like dark pavement, dark roofs, uh, stucco walls. And um, to make matters worse, our communities have a high degree of pre-existing uh, medical conditions like asthma, hypertension, diabetes, all of which extreme heat makes worse. And then uh, the third uh, whammy is that uh, many of our communities don't have the resources to rebound when a uh, climate shock like extreme heat strikes. And so uh, growing up, I did work in warehouses in Vernon, uh, and I also worked as a contractor for a very short time uh, with my, my, uh, a few of my family members. And I have to tell you, both of these segments of our uh, workforce is not protected in the state of California, particularly our indoor warehouse workers. Uh, they don't have any heat illness prevention standards, uh, that will protect them uh, at the workplace and at home. And our construction workers um, don't have enough people monitoring at the state level that they, are, that they remain safe during heat waves. Uh, as of last count, Cal OSHA has about 230 inspectors statewide. 32 of them are bilingual. And so Climate Resolve has been working hard to change that by advocating for more funding for uh, Cal OSHA, by advocating with many other statewide partners to promulgate an indoor heat illness prevention standard. But more importantly, when it comes to protecting our communities from extreme heat, we are also involved with urban greening projects. We have very comprehensive projects in Boyle Heights in the San Fernando Valley 
and in South LA adjacent communities like the Baldwin Hills Park. Um, one of the projects that I'm really proud of is that uh, over the past couple of years, we have been running legislation in Sacramento uh, to promote better coordination around the over 60 state entities that are all involved with extreme heat mitigation or adaptation. Uh, sadly, our bills have died along the way, but a lot of our extreme heat cooling measures have been adopted in uh, programs like the Extreme Heat and Community Resilience Grant Program, which the Governor's Office of Planning and Research will be releasing the draft guidelines for at the end of summer. And what we envision that program doing is being somewhat of a clearinghouse around all the extreme heat programs and having the Office of Planning and Research um, find ways to integrate solutions rather than continuing to implement solutions in a, a, a one solution manner. So I think that that's one of the proudest achievements uh, working here at Climate Resolve is getting that pro program established, but also uh, fighting for a $135 million to implement that program. Um, and again, uh, extreme heat kills most Californians per year than all other climate hazards. Uh, the state is woefully uh, um, not doing a good job to protect people from getting hurt. And if it wasn't for organizations like those on this panel, um, I think that that number would be a lot higher than it is. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, Rene, would you like to take a stab at the question and let me know if you need to, for me to repeat it as well. Yeah, Pedro, can you please repeat it? Yeah, um, so share your experience with Extreme Heat and one project that you're really proud to have worked on. Okay, so um, let's see. So one thing that we do here at the San Gabriel Valley Conservation Corps and, and we do well is plant trees. Um, that That's the biggest impact that we make to the urban heat island effect. Uh, fiscal year 22, 23, we planted well over 500 trees. Uh, city of West Covina, we planted about 4,300 native plants and drought tolerant plants uh, throughout the city. Um, so that's how we're combating you know, heat. Uh, plants and trees are great at providing shade and, and everything else, right? I think everyone here is pretty familiar with the benefits of trees, but uh, for the most part, that, that isn't actually my, my most proud project that we're working on. It's actually our um, fuels reduction project in the Angeles National Forest. <clears throat> 2019, the Bobcat Fire destroyed over 115,000 acres. So, you know, we're doing something about it. We have Conservation Corps crews going up into the Angeles National Forest, removing invasive species, removing fire fuel to prevent wildfire from happening. Um, it, it's, a, it's an immediate threat. So I'm really happy that the state of California is implementing a wildfire task force throughout the region and providing more funding, more resources to organizations like mine. So really grateful to live in California. I know things aren't perfect, but, but at least, you know, they're providing us the tools and the resources. Um, like for example, implementing better policies to cut green tape, to, to uh, expedite projects, to really connect partners and establish community groups or collaboratives to address these threats like wildfire in our region. So planting trees is great, but, but wildfire is a, is a very serious threat here in the San Gabriel Valley because of our close proximity to our San Gabriel Mountains. Um, uh, so yeah, very proud of our crews. It, it's hard work. It's very hard work, but but it takes a work ethic. It takes an understanding how important this work is. So really proud of our crews. I think we we're at 45 acres of, of uh, fire fuel removed from the Angeles National Forest. So proud of our young, uh, young folks' hard work. Yeah, SGV in the house. Um, <laughs> Uh, thank you. And uh, so we'll pass it over to Lilia to, uh, to share your response next. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, and so um, at Communities for a Better Environment, or CBE, a lot of our work that addresses extreme heat is directly tied to some of our organizing campaigns. Um, so for example, we've been a part of a coalition to prevent the widening of the 710 freeway. Um, so for folks that are not familiar, um, at some point Caltrans and Metro wanted to widen the southern portion of the freeway that runs from East LA down to Long Beach, um, from eight lanes to 16 lanes. Um, and so members organize, we know that freeway widening was never an option. Um, but as part of this organizing, people really wanted to address conditions around the highway, um, and one of them being extreme heat and lack of green vegetation. Um, so in 2021, um, Caltrans and Metro struck down the plan to widen the freeway. Community organizing was a big part of that decision, right? Um, but we understood that the freeway as it stands is not good. Um, and so now we're part of a Metro investment plan um, to actually address some of these things on the highway. Um, and one of the things that people have been advocating for is more green space around the freeway. So to be able to renovate some of the parks, address some of the brown fields, um, but also add green buffers. Um, and also thinking about adding some freeway caps that you know provide innovative ways to add more greenery to the surroundings. Um, additionally, we're working on two parks um, that are directly next to the 710 freeway. Um, one of them being Clara Expansion Park in Cudahy. Um, We're renovating the park at the moment. If you're familiar, um, there's a lot of empty dirt, underutilized space. Um, um, so we're adding more native plants, more trees, more shade options, um, and we're doing something very similar um, in collaboration with um, East Yards in Maywood, um, where we're renovating the park, um, as well as adding um, a memorial to commemorate some of the, um, the Chicano movement um, that took place in the area. Um, and so yeah, so we're doing a lot of work around bringing in more green infrastructure, as well as addressing some of the um, environmental justice concerns um, in the area. Um, and one more project that I'll mention that we're actually actually currently prepping for that we have tomorrow um, is a partnership with NASA, uh, where our participants are learning GIS mapping to um, to identify different um, high temperature hotspots. Um, and we're combining them with their personal stories of places where they feel extreme heat um, to identify where it would be best to invest in more green space um, as we move forward further into this work. Thank you. That's so awesome. Yeah, my family used to live in Maywood too, so we used to visit all the time. Um, and uh, Paulina, would you like to round us out with this uh, with this question? Yes, of course. Um, thank you. I'm learning so much already, and you know, just talking about the South Seattle area, which is specifically is um, in the Wamish Valley and and the West part, South Park, um, which I'm going to be referring to as the neighborhood um, that has been impacted the most as, you know, we have about 4,200 um, neighbors um, that 70% of them are um, people of color and 40% immigrants. So many of this, um, you know, coincidence, uh, it doesn't happen for uh, like no reason. Environmental racism is real. And many of the things of people that are doing and my, my people like uh, here, um, trying to bring the best options for our neighborhoods that not only um, are dealing with one single issue at a time, but you know we also live next to a super fun site and we are uh, next to highways and next to uh, the airport and we're an airport path with so many of those um, uh, challenges that bring and contaminants uh, that our people and our children are breathing, bringing us to 13 life of years expectancy difference between one neighborhood in the South Seattle area and, and the North, um, just five miles apart. And then we have these many stressors and disparities, including the air, the water. And of course, when we talk about heat, um, last year, uh, as an example, we did have one of the longest summer here in, in Seattle. Um, and when we talk about neighborhoods like ours that are bad tops, because we live in the valley, so we are like a bad top and we're not only um, a, a, the impact that, that we breathe every day, but with the heat, uh, bringing it to the worst levels of the uh, contaminated air that we were breathing. So some of the things that we've been always um, doing with community voice that they wanted, of course, is plant green infrastructure. Um, but we do bring our youth to do that. They are the ones that are driving us to what do we think is best. And so far, we have planted more than 1,500 trees, but we realize, and them themselves said, 
um, Ms. Paulina, we don't, when are we going to be protected? Because the trees that we've been planting were obviously baby trees. So how do we make intentional turns? So we started talking to those partners to bring mature trees to be covering our almost non-existent um, park and access to green spaces because um, we don't have the same amount of parks that other neighborhoods would have, but it wasn't making any difference. So we have learned from that mistake, but also bringing that voice into driving what is best for us and to that infrastructure. Some of the things that we've been doing with the trees too is doing more community participatory um, research. And then we started studying moss in the trees uh, because we wanted to see the trees are the best thing that we can be doing. So, but, but also let's use the trees as a um, example of use the moss of the tree as a bioindicator of what pollutants are bringing. Um, and so our youth were the ones driving, um, co-participating with that with some scientists and they corroborated main um, of those contaminants uh, having heavy metals and lead and all those making it worse when there is a heat season that we are exposing our families to be um, uh, breathing that air when there is as hotter, but it was great for them to corroborate, you know, as community expertise that they know um, more data that we needed to prove and to bring what will be the best solutions to address. So one of the things that you know we're doing is tackling, you know, as having the high asthma rates, as many of our colleagues here have mentioned. How do we bring solutions that are more targeted to um, change and to really come to the root cause of eliminating? eliminating all these um, different challenges that we have. So some of the things that we're doing is having asthma intervention, um, a, using air filters um, that are going to be customized by communities. So we have been working with community and building themselves and learn how to do indoor pollution and in the heat, how that exacerbates the asthma rates that we have here. Um, so we've been doing um, uh, building with them and with the youth going to families and also identifying um, who is mostly, um, you know, of the elder population and children with asthma. And then we go to those homes uh, besides with the trees. Um, but we have also been working very intentionally of equity driven public policies because we know that um, the root causes are um, obviously on how we are defining our communities and how are we the land policies that we've been living in. And so how do we make the industries uh, be more responsible um, and how do we make um, better legislation for um, Washington state that um, really brings um, on this awareness of cumulative impacts that we have here, like in the Duwamish Valley. Um, so, you know, building your infrastructure has been very important planting trees, doing more uh, shaded, you know, uh, opportunities to bring community, but also making sure the government is being accountable and bringing those community driven um, priorities to reality and um, based on, you know, those policies that are going to be hopefully changing the root causes of making us this um, um, volatile to the climate change. Thank you so much. And by the way, I see that book in, the, in your in the, in the corner of the river that made Seattle. That looks really cool. Um, <laughs> um, so for, for our for our panelists, I have uh, do want to do a quick time check. We have about ten minutes or so, um, and I want to ask this next question to get into some of like how you view your work and some of the culture um, and framing around it. So the question for you all is, how is our relationship with the natural world taken into account in your work or just in how you communicate. Um, you know, from, from my side of things, like definitely view some of my work as part of like reconnecting with our long ancestry of like, you know, stewarding lands and, you know, existing, um, coexisting with plants and animals. So I'm, I'm curious what, uh, how you all view your, your relationship with the natural world through, through your work as well too. So we can start off, um, with Delia, then go to Paulina, Renee, and then Enrique. So um, Delia, if you wouldn't mind, uh, maybe in about a minute or two. Sure, thank you. Um, so as we do work around green infrastructure, um, we're trying to be very intentional about collaborating with Tongva communities. Um, so for both of our park projects, we have 
um, official partnerships with uh, with different um, Tongva leaders that are supporting and guiding um, our process. We wanted to make sure that we included their voices from the beginning. Um, and at the same time, we also recognize that a lot of our members are migrants. A lot of them are indigenous themselves. Um, and so one of we're, we, we've done a visioning for a community garden um, in Karehe. And a lot of that is rooted in ancestral knowledge and thinking about what types of medicinal medicine or medicinal herbs. Um, a lot of our members want to not only plant, but also do teachings around, right? Um, and I think something that we also emphasize a lot is that a lot of our community members um, have been forced to migrate here, right, from very different communities where, you know, back home in their homeland, it doesn't look as industrial as it looks here, right? Um, and so that's something that people always strive for and think about as we do some of this visioning um, do, and doing some of the harm that, you know, capitalism um, and, all, and all of these different forces have um, really, yeah, put on our communities. Um, but yeah, for us, it's really intentional partnerships with Indigenous communities to ensure that we're not only respecting um, practices that have been established in the past, but we're also incorporating some of our member feedback. Awesome. Um, Renee, would you want to take us uh, with your perspective next? Yeah, you mind repeating the question, Pedro? I just want to make sure I answer it. I got you. Yeah, it's a, uh, how is our relationship with the natural world um, taking into, into account through your work? Oh, okay. Yeah, so, you know, a lot of the youth that we work with uh, have never been to the San Gabriel Mountains. They've never been to regional parks. They've never been outdoors, right? So, so there's this term called nature deficit disorder that isn't really recognized by the medical community. It's more of a pseudoscience type thing, uh, but nature deficit disorder is very real, right? Um, we have so much screen time <clears throat> we're surrounded by technology, we're surrounded by Wi-Fi, and we don't quite understand how it's going to impact our long-term health and evolution. Um, so the youth that I was mentioning, you know, they've never been in the mountains, they've never been to regional parks. How do we expect people that have never been to care about the outdoors, right, to advocate for nature, to plant a tree. <laughs> it's just not realistic to do that. So there's a nonprofit that, we're, that we actually really know, know really well called Nature for All. Um, they take people outdoors. They, they take low-income communities. They take, you know, different types of people, and they take them on free field trips to the beach, to, to the mountains, to different places. So we need organizations like them to really provide these free resources. We've actually partnered with them for two field trips and it was great. Um, a lot of our youth, the only time they went to the mountains was when we were doing our forest conservation projects. So that, that's a really big deal for us because you, you see the crews that went up to the mountains, when they return, they just feel different. They look different. They feel more energetic as opposed to the crews that were maybe staying local, doing tree watering projects or city beautification projects. They come back tired just like everyone else, but they don't have that same balance that the people that went up into the mountains, right? Being immersed in nature is so therapeutic. It, it's just, it's transformative. And over the course of our program year, you see these people start to change and, and start to become more, you know, more like an environmental steward as opposed to just a program participant. Um, so that's something that I love to see. Uh, I love seeing people really recognize that hey, you know, this is our San Gabriel Mountains. These are our trees. These are our parks that we have to maintain and take care of. And they only get to that mindset when we take them there, right? Like Nature for All, like the San Gabriel Valley Conservation Corps. Um, so yeah, I think that answered your question, Pedro. Thank you. Um, and so now I'll uh, pass the mic over to uh, Paulina. Thank you. Um, what Renee said is so, so great and uh, truth about this nature deficit and uh, something that we always say, you know, you, you can't take care of something unless you know what it is and our youth. Um, what we do is take them to the river. Um, it, I know we know it's a super fun site, but it's also a beautiful river right in the corner of everyone's home. So we want to take them the more we can and do kayak tours and um, have them understand the importance of 
this is the, the only river that Seattle has, and we want to have them to have that ownership to protect it. And so we do very intentional going out with them um, and themselves, then they could be having this sense of what Renee was describing. They come back different. And, and it's true. I've seen it in their eyes. Once they are exposed to um, understanding, you know, what the importance of this river um, uh, and the importance of being our caring for nature, um, then they themselves will come with the solutions. And that's what we want to see uh, reflected in them having that, you know, when they have planted trees, they have really um, have this community ownership that we see in that um, a connection that we have seen uh, passing by another day and say, oh, look, I planted that tree. That would be good for my little sister, you know, like having this sense of, um, you know, ownership and also a responsibility that they are making an impact. I think it's so important to um, involve them and in doing this research and, and knowing that they are themselves delivering a better future. If they don't connect, they won't care for it. Point very well made. Um, and uh, Enrique, I'll uh, pass it to you to round us out for this uh, uh, last question. Yeah, what a great question. So uh, here at Climate Resolve, first and foremost, uh, we believe that we should use nature as a model. Um, if you step back for a second and realize that nature has been evolving for over 4 billion years, uh, I think that nature's got it pretty down pat as to what it means to be resilient. Uh, however, we also need to recognize that nature is in deep trouble. Um, because of our uh, just wasteful release of pollution and greenhouse gases, we've actually altered our ecosphere enough to where we've created our own era called the Anthropocene. And what that means is that we are living in an era where if we don't act quickly, that ecosphere could collapse. And so we need to recognize that uh, many of our strategies to date, we need to guard against maladaptation. And one way that we are looking to do that is by combining things like urban greening with more shade structures, combining things like urban greening with more cool pavement, because research shows that when we're able to get those kinds of prescriptions right, mortality is reduced significantly to the tune of 60%. And so this is a social justice issue. We need to make sure that our gente is protected from extreme heat. Again, 3,900 deaths a year, most of them happening in our communities. And so the way forward is to integrate solutions like cool pavement and urban greening to get that accomplished. Man, y'all are so cool. Um, <laughs> I wanna, I wanna um, transition us to our community uh, Q&A section. Um, but I want to ask one more question. So I'll, uh, we can do a lightning round and just keep responses to like one sentence. Um, but so I, I, I know, again, I want to give everyone time to think of some questions too. But in, in one sentence, what do we need to like solve the problem in the long term? Right? Um, no pressure, but we'll start off with um, Paulina, then Delia, Renee, and then Enrique. So your Christmas wish list, what do we need to solve things? Um, I think we need um, one, one sentence, right? Or oh, no one word. OK. One sentence. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I do think that we need to um, create capacity, community capacity, empowerment um, for all, all the people that have left behind for the longest time. Sorry, that was a long sentence. Still count. Uh, Lilia. Um, I would say community-led solutions and corporate accountability. Yeah, uh, Renee. I, I think we need bold leadership 
but most importantly, servant leadership. And uh, Enrique. I'm going to say we need more money. We need parity in funding. Most of the funds that come from the state budget to do climate resilience are going to our coastal communities. They're going to our rural mountain communities like Inyo County and the North Coast. Uh, what about people? Who's protecting people's health from extreme heat? So we need parity in funding. Uh, the budget this year is woefully inadequate. Uh, it funds extreme heat adaptation less than 1%. Awesome. Yes. Sorry for making y'all do the Cliff Notes version. Um, <laughs> I'm sure each one of these can be its own hour webinar, but I really appreciate it. And I wanted to make time for um, questions from the audience as well, too. So I'm going to pass it over to my wonderful, wonderful colleague, Andrea, to facilitate our Q&A section. So um, take it away. Thanks so much, Pedro. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Or good very end of your morning, depending where you are. I'm Andrea. I'm the Sustainable Communities Program Director. Um, we'd love to open it up to questions. So you can either raise your hand um, in, in Zoom or um, drop your question in the chat and I will facilitate from there. So um, this has been a very, very um, interesting, engaging and informative panel. So I'm sure many people have questions. Um, Um, so we have a question in the chat from Kat, um, and it says, what employment skills do you see as being currently most in demand in environmental and climate justice fields? Um, panelists, is there someone that would like to take that question? Renee? Yeah, yeah, I'll take it. Um, I mean, off the top of my head, besides the technical side of things, like you know, just understanding solutions and and um, methods to plant more trees to do certain projects. I, I think communication and community engagement is going to be crucial because I, I think uh, one of the panelists mentioned, you know, the youth drive policy change, the people drive policy change. So uh, I think if we can be better communicators and, and really involve more communities, we can really hold our legislators accountable to get more funding, right, Enrique? Because once we start moving, maybe not together, but one step at a time together, then I think we can really create momentum and, and get the change we most definitely need. I just wanted to add from Renee, um, maritime is where it is. Um, many of the forces that are um, actually getting, you know, to retired, uh, that being majority white led and with all those amazing jobs that have a lot to do is in the maritime. And that's what we being, uh, we actually, Open, just open a maritime high school because um, really within our own community, nobody knows what maritime jobs are. And, um, you know, we in Seattle, for example, being having a very important port and the impacts that brings, but those careers have not been taken by um, our Latino community from our youth of color or uh, in general, our communities of color. So um, I think uh, we need to, you know, be thinking about um, all those um jobs that are not going to be not being taken by our own maritime it is thank you both so much um we have a question from floribella go ahead hi yes my name is floribella i am from albuquerque new mexico i wanted to know if there um where I can find information if there's organizations um, such as the ones that you guys are from that are here in New Mexico. Um, if you guys have a site or are aware of some names of organizations here. That's a really great question. If, um, if folks have information about organizations in New Mexico, or I would encourage um, elsewhere, because I'm sure there's folks from all over the country here, um, please drop them in the chat. That would be really, really helpful for many people present. Um, 
And then we have another question in the chat um, from Sean. If there are no strings attached, are we willing to accept funding from all sectors and entities, or are we looking for funding from entities who closely align with our views? Um, which of the, anybody panelists, feel free to jump in. I can jump in. Um, I know that um, as CBE, we don't take funding from oil companies or other different types of like known polluters. Um, I think it's really important that, you know, as we grow our funding infrastructure, that we also think about like where the money is coming from. Um, even if the funding doesn't have any strings attached, you know, oftentimes these corporations use it as tax breaks for them, right? Um, so um, I know that for us, you know, we're really intentional about, you know, thinking about like what banks we partner with um, and, and who we're doing our funding or yeah and, and also around like really building up our grassroots funding uh, fundraising organizing um to ensure that you know we have more control over the money that we're raising um and that you know we're not necessarily tied to as many deliverables as well and that our, our community has more control over that funding thank you so much anybody else any other panelists i would just say you know right now there is so much momentum of environmental justice um talk and funding um, and I do think is the right time to be claiming all that mm, funding and money. What I have not seen is um, a really um, a path not to be overwhelming of those federal dollars access uh, coming from community organizations. So um, I am just bringing it to this space because of the need for us to be stronger, um, saying that that is not equitable right now. Every day uh, you may read like this amount of money coming from the um, infrastructure bill and from Justice 40, but I don't think the government has prepared the system to make accessible to those funding. So I think as a collective, we can make um, an effort to, yes, we deserve that money. We need our communities deserve that money to make all the improvements that we need to and whatever priorities we have. Uh, but we need to be acting as a collective to make sure we keep the government accountable. And there's two less, maybe 12 more months to spend all those amount of money that being um, announced, but not yet a good path for us to make it accessible. Thank you so much, Enrique. Uh, Rene, I want to give you space to, to jump in if you would like to. I'd love to. Any chance you can repeat the question? I was multitasking on the chat. <laughs> of course. Happens to all of us. Um, if there are no strings attached, are we willing to accept funding from all sectors or entities, or are we looking for funding from entities who closely align with our views? Uh, yeah, that's a really, really good question and a very complex and nuanced question. Uh, Climate Resolve has a very uh, good uh, vetting system in place, ensuring that any funding that we um, uh, decide to bring into the organization, that it goes through a matrix of sort uh, with a very heavy equity lens. And so we will not take money from the fossil fuel companies. That's just a no-no. Uh, we will not take money from carbon sequestration and storage folks uh, or any folks uh, who are heavily invested in fossil fuel uh, organizations. Thank you so much. Um, Renee, did you did you feel compelled to answer this question? Yeah, like Enrica said, it's 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 rather complicated because you don't want to take money from polluters that are only doing it to I don't know. California has the the, the CCI, right? And it's just it's complicated because Cal Fire receives funding from these kind of investor or these kind of corporations that have violated certain laws or or tax credits and and anyways long story short is it's complicated because i i don't think we fully grasp the severity of the climate crisis i personally believe when we have 10 or 15 years to really advance in our systems and 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 habits uh, of consumption as human beings. Uh, the fires that we recently had, um, I don't know if there's any climate models from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, that mentions the, the fires in um, 
in Siberia, right? The fires here in, in California. So I, I don't know if there's any climate models that have accurately measured all that GHG in the atmosphere. I could be wrong, but but the last one I read in 2018 didn't talk about those fires. So uh, long story short, I, I think we definitely need to be um, true to our cause and our mission. But at some point, um, you know, hard decisions have to be made. And 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 if the funding is there, right? Because this is all hypothetical. If the yeah, and the fires in Canada too. Um, so if the funding is there, then I think we should use it. But definitely, like Dila said, you know, what is it attached to? What sort of deliverables, guidelines outline the project? But but in terms of the systemic change we need to make to get to the to there, I think that's the first step, right? How do we change? How do we advocate? How do we get the funding first? as opposed to assuming it's already there from corporations, lobbyists, whomever. I think that's the question that we need to be asking ourselves is how do we really make this happen? And I think Green Latinos is doing a, a great job at that. You guys are helping us connect nationally, right? Um, hopefully in Albuquerque, that young lady gets some, some uh, information on local community-based organizations. So, so this is essential to getting that funding. The work that Green Latinos is doing, the fact that everyone here on the call is, is a climate leader, right? I, I think this is building momentum. This is how we get that funding. Thank you. And, and what could be a better note to end on. I'm conscious of the fact that we only have um, about three minutes left. Um, as a sort of second follow-up to uh, Florida's question, we're gonna drop a, um, a resource sheet into the chat and we'll also um, email it out after the encuentro that just includes some information about some of the topics we discussed today, including links to um, the websites of all the information um, of our, our speakers, the organizations they represent. So thank you all so much for being here. Um, we're gonna pull back up our slides just so that um, on screen folks can see, um, you know, ways that, that you can get involved with the work that we're doing here at Green Latinos. Earlier um, in the conversation, we, add, we dropped a link into the chat um, for joining uh, for becoming a Green Latinos member. Um, we also have colectivos, which are collectives that are orga you know, organized um, according to policy areas and interests. And we really encourage folks to um, join those as well. So thank you so, so much um, to our panelists for, for your um, amazing information, your knowledge, your expertise, your wonderful um, examples of the work that you're doing in your communities. Um, I'm gonna turn it um, over to Amanda for some closing thoughts. Yeah, thank you so much, Andrea. And honestly, just uh, everyone do like a round of applause reaction for our amazing panelists. I hope you all feel like inspired and learned a lot. I know that I feel very inspired after listening to our panelists and such an amazing discussion. Thank you so, so much. Um, yeah, like Andrea said, um, we're dropping links in the chat to join our Green Latinos network and also colectivos. And also wanted to give a very quick uh, plug for Nature for All. Rene actually mentioned this in um, one of his answers, but Nature for All is an organization that's working on getting youth to um, out in nature. And right now, actually, they're taking applications for their CELA Leadership Academy which their um, application deadline got extended. So I'm gonna drop that in the chat. If you are interested or know youth that are interested in getting involved in public land advocacy, definitely take a uh, look at the link and apply. And yeah, here are our um, contact information. Uh, we don't want to end the conversation here. We wanna to continue to build relationships with you all and continue having these very meaningful conversations about how to help our community. So please take our contact information down, reach out to us. We're more than happy to um, talk to you and continue to build this comunidad with you all. So thank you for being here and yeah, looking forward to connecting more in the future. Before we log off, uh, I hear a request for a photo. Oh yeah, let's do that. 
Uh, yes. yeah. Maybe we can stop can we sharing the, the share slides, so you can... <laughs> take a photo. All right, everyone. This is a moment to come on. You don't mind just for a second. You're also welcome to stay uh, off if you want. Who's taking? I'll take one on three. So another second to come off camera if you want. One, two, three. Got it. Love it. Thank you. Thank you Thank all. You, si se puede, vamos. <laughs> Yay. Thank you all. Okay, I'm going to close this thing. Thank you all so much. Bye. 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 See ya.